Hello and welcome to September's Three Book Friday with Hull Noir. Um, I'm Nick Triplo, writer and along with um, co-founder of Hull Noir, Nick Quantrill and writer. Um, we've asked our two guests to choose three books that uh, mean quite a lot to them. A, a book that's been given to them, a book that they've given to somebody else or that they'd recommend and a book that's influenced their own writing. And so we'll be talking about what makes those must reads. So please like and subscribe the video if you do like it and you want to subscribe. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Nick now to introduce our guests for this evening. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. So I'll just do two very quick, brief introductions as usual, so we can get stuck straight into the, our guest choices. Um, Erwis Khan was born in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, in the Company of Strangers was published by Simon and & Schuster, and he studied creative writing at the Faber Academy. Uh, his latest novel, No Honor, is published by Arenda Books. Uh, and our second guest is Rhiannon Ward, uh, which is the pen name of crime writer Sarah Ward. Uh, as Rhiannon, she's a writer of two Gothic mysteries and um, with the latest, The Shadowing, published this September by Trapeze. Uh, and Rhiannon is also a creative writing tutor and um, book reviewer. So we've got two very wise heads with us. So our first category is a favourite book that I was given. So let's start with you, Ervis. Um, you've chosen She's Man by A.A. Chowdhury, which is a book I've seen around a lot on Twitter. Um, and I've not got around to reading yet. So you tell us, uh, why it's a favorite book of yours, if you wouldn't mind, please. Yes, so uh, She's Mine is uh, one of my favorites that I was actually given before it was published. So that's why I got a chance to read it. Uh, I think it's a psychological thriller has become, mm. uh, it's a very popular genre. So there's a lot of competition. So it's very hard for a book to stand out. Uh, so for when I read She's Mine, I knew that this was a book that was going to stand out because it's a very unique perspective. It's about a mother who's lost her child, uh, as in that child has been stolen from her. And that it's about her and how she uh, makes that journey through it all. And then she, how those different realizations come to her. So it's about a mother who's not entirely good. So there are shades of gray in that uh, character. So that's what I really liked about uh, the novel that it had, it had shades of gray. So, and three dimensional characters, which are so important in, psycholog uh, in psychological thrillers. A lot of, uh, sometimes we, we're at a risk of, uh, be, uh, of the characters being two dimensional. So, uh, so that's what I loved about A.H. Audrey's writing that the uh, characters are three dimensional and very engaging style. It's, uh, it's an absolutely lovely thriller. So that's what drew, drew me to it. Yeah, excellent. Have you read it, Sarah? Is it a book that you've come across? No, but like you, I've seen it on Twitter and I and yeah. uh, always uh, made a very good uh, uh, summary of it that makes me actually want to read it. So I, I like books where characters are neither nice or completely nice or completely terrible. Yeah. So the, the Shades of Grey really appeals to me. So I would certainly give it a go. Yeah. And I, 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 when I was reading the kind of reviews online, a lot of the reviewers talk about it has a really great twist towards the end. I mean, that's that's kind of an important aspect, isn't it, of psychological suspense. I've been able to kind of complete, to be able to kind of not not trick the reader, but be able to kind of just complete them enough so that it becomes a, a genuine surprise, isn't it, when the twist comes. So, uh, as a reader, was that? Did you spot the twist coming early, or are you are you too kind of seasoned as a writer that you kind of see them come a little bit before they hit you? You, you know, I, even I, I used to think that when I when I started writing books, I thought that maybe I've ruined reading for myself and mm. that I'll be able to figure out whatever's going on. But it's not been the case. And I enjoy reading as much as uh, ever. Uh, and no, I couldn't figure out the twist at all, which made it even better. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, like, uh, like uh, Sarah was saying that uh, you nobody wants a Miss Goody Two Shoes these days. Everyone wants to have a character with shades of gray. So that's what makes it so much enjoyable. So now I wasn't able to figure out the twist. So that's one of the, I think, advantages of that novel. Excellent. Yeah, and I think, as, you, as you said in the first bit, when you summarise a book, it's, it's so difficult to stand out since it was psychological thrills because there's so mm -hmm. many around and there's so many good ones around as well. Trying to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you, is, there, is there another book coming from Alex, do you know? Is it, cause I'm, I know so I've seen you do events online together, so I'm guessing that you're quite kind of friendly when it comes to yeah. working she's, together. And she, she's, she's also written crime fiction, uh, The Scribe and The Abduction. Uh, but they're strictly crime. Uh, they're not psychological thrillers at all. So this is her debut psychological thriller. But uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I remember back when Gone Girl came out in 2011 or 2010, everyone said that, you know, this is just a few years of psychological thrillers and then this genre will die out. Mm -hmm. 
and instead it has just gathered steam and now psychological thrillers dominate the market more or less yeah and i, I don't think they've ever i know you, you spoke about them having like a moment of having kind of two or three years where they were everywhere and they were really big but we've always had psychological thrillers haven't we you know you go back to people like yeah. Ice Smith, don't you and um Definitely oh, yeah. and so on yeah so you know yeah. I think it's, it's kind of nothing new it's that is the way that the authors maybe give it a new and fresh twist into it, something contemporary yeah. i think that's the that's the thing isn't yeah. it so Let's talk about your first yeah, think... oh, Sorry, you were going to say something? No, no, no. I, I was just uh, <laughs> agreeing with you. Oh, okay. So your first, your choice, Sarah, a book that you was, um, my favourite book that you was given is, um, was one I wasn't um, familiar with. Thus was Adonis Murdered by Sarah Caldwell, mm. which is, uh, it was published in 1981. And when I looked it up online, it's described as a legal mystery, which is kind of an interesting description and it involves the inland revenue. So I was kind of thinking, <laughs> How on earth can this be such an interesting book? So well, it, it, it's as much the story, really. So I've got my old battered copy here. Um, so nineteen eighties, early eighties crime fiction is kind of you know not not very popular at the moment. Um, this was given to me by a blogger called Moira Redmond, who writes a blog called Closing Books. And uh, in 2013, when I was going through a horrible divorce, um, she said, I've, I'm going to send you a book. And she says, I always send exactly the same book to, to friends who, it, when I think they need cheering up. So she sent me, um, Thus Was Adonis Murdered. And it's basically a, a, a crime novel, sort of slightly humorous crime novel set in the world of Horace Rumpole. So if you, if you like the Rumpole of the Bailey, I mean, it's that world. It's the, it's the, the wine swilling um, in, um, inns of court in London. But one of the barristers goes to Italy and she's fairly um, sort of, she's very, very intelligent and she's quite, um, uh, but, but she, she always makes loads of mistakes and has loads of accidents. And she gets involved in a murder, she gets accused of being a, a, a killer. Um, and so it's all, uh, it's all uh, the story is um, told in the in the form of letters. And I'd been thinking about this book before you actually got in touch to say, you know, come on, come on and talk about a book that you've been given, because um, I recently read a book that's doing really well at the moment called The Appeal by Janice Hallett. Uh, Hallett, Hallett isn't it yeah. and um, it's all written in letters so as a reader you just read all all these letters and you get to the end it's a whodunit and it's a very very similar format in this book it there is some prose but the vast majority is letters received by all the barristers back in you know the Horace Rumpel um, sort of uh, setting trying to work out what's happened in Venice so you're slightly removed and and the what and the writing's very reminiscent of Jews and Worcester it's that sort of humorous crime and I'm not really normally into humorous crime I like my crime fiction quite bleak you know I love my Scandinavian crime fiction and so on so the bleaker the better but it's it's just something I would never in a million years have picked up and sort of the kindness of somebody thinking this is what you need to read right now and also the fact that she, she does it to, you know, it's the same book she gives to um, every all her friends who need it. I think it's wonderful. And actually, my, when I pulled it out, because I thought I'll just familiarise myself, I've, I've got the original note she wrote to me That's saying, you know, um, you know, I hope you enjoy it. And I'd like to meet you one day in real life. Well, I've met her a few times now. I mean, it's, a, it's sort of a moment in time, really. <laughs> Sorry? I was going to say, is that a book you're familiar with as well, Aries, or is it one that's new to you? Oh, me? Yeah. Um, I, no, I haven't read this, but I did read uh, the other book that you mentioned, The Appeal. The Appeal, yeah. And uh, I literally read it in, in a single day, in 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, have, I don't remember the last time I read uh, a book so fast. <laughs> so it... it, it uh, <coughs> this, the, 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 the format that Sarah's mentioning, the letter format, it, it works really well because you keep on reading and you're like, oh, it's nothing, just one more letter, one more letter. Yeah. And, and you don't realize that you've been reading well into the night. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I, I, I like the idea of a comfort read as well. That's a really kind of interesting way of putting it. I mean, I always think, I'm not sure I have a comfort read, but when I kind of feel like I'm in a little bit of a dip with reading, I pick up an Elmore Leonard novel. You know, so that's my mm -hmm. comfort read, I think, is an Elmore Leonard novel. I don't know if, if Nick and, and, and Aries have got your own comfort reads that you would turn to in sort of times of needing a little bit of a boost when it comes to, to reading? Well, actually, we're, we're going to talk about one of them in a little while, actually. All right, OK. Today, so I'm, I'm going to pitch in there. I'm going to ask Oasis now about his, um, a book that you'd pass on. And that I'd pass on, yes. Uh, so that would be Better Confess <laughs> by Alan Gorvin. So I have it here with me. And uh, this is actually uh, another crime fiction. Uh, and uh, the good thing about this book is that... Uh, 
Alan Gorman writes in a way that he writes crime, but there's this humor to it. And that's what makes him unique. And that's what I love about his books that you keep on laughing throughout the book. Uh, I mean, not like outright laughing, but you know, you keep sniggering and smirking. So it, it he makes it all very fun. And his character is just like Alex. I think I do have a thing, like Sarah says, uh, I do have a thing about uh, not have uh, about characters with shade of, shades of gray. So that's exactly what Alan does with his characters as well. So Better Confess is basically about an online forum where you can basically get uh, where what your darkest thoughts and desires can actually uh, come true. You can hire someone to do whatever they want. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's really, that's what really drew me to this book. And uh, yeah. It, it, it sounds like a virtual strangers on a train. We're back to Patricia mm. Heisman. Yes. Yes, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would, that, 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 it could be similar to that, but uh, but yeah, I, it's the his style of writing that I really like. He he writes. Uh, I mean, it's all very fast paced, but it's all interspersed with uh, lots of humor, which I love. So yeah, it sounds a bit little bit like um, Agatha Christie's The Pale Horse as well, where um, you can sort of pay for somebody to uh, do whatever you want. Really, uh, yeah. it sounds it sounds great actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're actually right. Uh, this it does remind me a little bit about Agatha of Agatha Christie's novels. That's true, but uh, but yeah, I, I do like when I discover an author whose whose writing is completely unique. So that or that that stays with me for a long <coughs> time. Has it got quite a unique voice? Yeah, yeah, I would say that. So when you read his book, you'll realize. Uh, Better confess is my favorite one that uh, of his uh, other books. He's written quite a few books, but this one is my favorite. Cool. Have you read it, Nick? No, I haven't. It's another of these names that I keep seeing on Twitter, and people keep saying to me, <laughs> "It's a brilliant book," you know. But there's only so many hours of the there for reading, and it's kind of one of those that. And I've needed a little kick to get to it. I think it might be tonight. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I'm I'm, very, I'm aware of Alan's work, and and, and like he always says, I like that kind of way that humour is sort of incorporated into crime fiction. I'm a big lover of yeah. Anton Leonard, you know, and I think he's great for that. And, um, <laughs> you know, writers like Chris Brookmeyer, um, Colin, Colin Bateman in, in Ireland, you know, they do it really well, don't they, they incorporate humour. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, this is very much up my street, and I think that kind of, that, that modern twist on Strangers on a Train you know, makes it very appealing, doesn't yeah. it, well, yeah. because we're all, we're all online, we're all connected, aren't we? And it's kind of, I guess it tapped into some of the, some of our fears about the online world, this book as well, because of the way, yeah. you know, you you can you think you're anonymous, but obviously for a protagonist in this yeah. book, it becomes a very real life scenario, doesn't it? You, um, you want to, yeah, go ahead. Now go on, go on. I, I, just, I just wanted to say that, Nick, you won't sleep a wink tonight, so you better, <laughs> you might want to start it tomorrow instead start of tonight. Weekend, maybe. <laughs> that might be the better show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Sarah, we're going to move on to your choice that you'd pass on, and I guess it's one. It's a, in every list anyone's ever asked me about books you reread and books you love. That this pretty much always crops up. So, tell us what what it is about um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy that so makes it so special. I think well, I think it's probably one of my favourite books ever. Really, um, I have I've got a friend who, who over lockdown, who's very who's very very literary. She runs book festivals and so on, and over lockdown, she'd never and she'd never read a Le Carre, so she read his entire list over lockdown. And I remember thinking, I am so jealous. Imagine reading Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy for the first time. I mean, it would be absolutely brilliant. I mean, I've reread it. Uh, you've never you've, not, <laughs> you've got. Yeah, but you know the story because you've seen the film. I've seen, I've seen the film, yeah. yeah. I, I read it as a teenager. So my my school library had copies of it. And I so I remember reading it as a teenager. And then I watched the um, the TV adaptation with Alec Guinness, the 90, in late 1970s of both Tinker Taylor and uh, Smiley's People. Um, and it's just the plot, the plot is amazing. So it's a spy, those who don't who don't know it, it's a, it's a spy story. There's a, um, there's a traitor, um, a mole in, at the heart of British intelligence and uh, George Smiley, who has, is, um, has been let go because the control, the control tried to find out who it was and it all went wrong. He's tasked by the sort of minister's private secretary to try and hunt out the mole. Um, and it's all sort of 
all it was all written um, in the aftermath, really, of the Cambridge spies, Kim Philby, and so on. The idea that someone from a Russian spy could infiltrate the heart of um, uh, the, the intelligence service and, and be one of them. It wasn't somebody other. It's actually somebody part of the establishment, um, which is basically what what happens here. And it's superbly plotted. And it, I could just re I could sit down and reread it all over again. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, it's, it's one of those that I, I've probably read that more than I've read any other book <laughs> ever mm. for that reason. And it is a, definitely a comfort read. Yeah. I, I, think I probably came to it about the same time you would have done in my late teens. And it was one of those that's it's just stayed with me. Have you read it away? I haven't, but I have it in my uh, collection. I bought quite a few of his uh... Uh, books but i really want now that uh, i've heard sarah and you talking about it i'm just definitely going to read it i, th I think it's one of those books isn't it sarah where you, we often end up having conversations about genre fiction versus literary fiction and it's one of those books that you always take and go you tell me the difference Completely, yeah, because it's not just about the plot. I mean, the plot is absolutely fantastic, but also the characters are, are amazing. So George Smiley in himself, and there's a Derbyshire connection as, uh, too, because um, the uh, the head of um, MI6 um, is part uh, at the time was partly based. Uh, George Smiley was partly uh, based on him, uh, Maurice Oldfield. So um, you yeah, know, there's a Derbyshire connection as well. But the characters are really great, and I can sort of play conversation dialogue dialogue in my head, you know, Tinker, uh, Percy, I think it's Tinker, Percy Aline, um, Taylor, uh, Bill Hayden, you know, the, the, the sort of the idea yeah. of trying to find out who it is. And I, I, yeah, it's just such a great book. I have to ask you, what do you think of the, the, the Gary Oldman smiley? I don't mind it. I watched it about six months ago. I don't mind it. I don't, you know, it's such a complex book. It needs longer than a film. It doesn't yeah. naturally. Um, and I, because I know the book so well, I can understand the film. I just wonder if you were just watching the film, if things would just wouldn't quite make sense because you can't explain it in such a short period of time. I don't know. Yeah. I need to read it. I, mean, I have read other Carrier novels. I read um, Agent Within in the Field recently. Um, obviously, his latest book, or his, before yeah. the book comes out later this year. But yeah, for me as well, spy novels were very much a lockdown discovery. I've not read an awful lot of spy fiction until this last 18 months. And I, I kind of don't know why, but. I think this is maybe is there something there in in Le Carre's way that there's a, there's a certainty in between like the Cold War kind of draws land onto it is easy it's, it's the it's the West versus Russia into you know the we we kind of understand the Cold War Cold War yeah. now geopolitics are, are so much different now it's such a difficult kind of complex well to understand that maybe he gives us a little bit of comfort in his in his novels in some way. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm a big Le Carre fan, so I love the little drummer girl. Um, and that's not the Cold War. That's um, yeah. uh, you know Jerusalem, and so uh, you know set in Jerusalem. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. But you know, if you wanted to start with something that was slightly light, lighter, but small or so small or whatever, um, a call for call for the dead, the first Smiley um, novel is, is 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 a slim thing, but it, it's still great. You know, he's such a great character, and uh, yeah. I think, I think Le is one of my favourite authors of all time, really. And I think the spy that came who came in from the cold mm. is another one where, you know, as a standalone novel, it's it's just a great piece. Of, I mean, it's it's the it's a noir novel, really. It is, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I could talk about this all night, Nick. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on then to our um, to our third category, which is always a very interesting one. I think it's books that influence your own writing. So we get to kind of know a little bit behind the process, I think, with this question. So uh, we've got The Waiting Rooms by Eve Smith, haven't we? Do you want to tell us a bit about that one? Uh, which that's kind of a, it's not one I automatically kind of connected to your writing, but I'm guessing um, there is something in there that kind of resonates. For me? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so the, the, one, the one book that I felt really influenced my writing uh, actually recently is uh, Eve Smith's The Waiting Rooms. And there's a very good reason for this, because if you've read this book, it's kind of a literary thriller. And that is exactly what I try to do with my books. My books, I mean, they're not strictly crime. They're not strictly literary fiction. They're kind of like in the middle, they're kind of like literary thrillers. So when I was reading this book, I remember I was totally swept up into, uh, swept into the world. And uh, 
the way Eve Eve has created this. I mean, she wrote wrote it before the pandemic, mm-hmm. and th- back then there was no hint indication at all that there would be a pandemic any time in the future. But when you read this book, it's it looks like she's written it yesterday. I mean, the way she describes everything, the masks and the and the antibiotic resistance, and literally as if she has she's seen the future or something, mm-hmm. and that that sort of inspired me to write No Honor. I was writing No Honor at the time, and I got that inspiration from her book as to how to uh, use literary fiction, but write it in a way that it seems like a thriller and something fast paced and it can something you can read in a single day. And that's what I've been getting from a lot of my readers when they read No Honor. They're like, we read it in a single day. And that is what uh, I did with Eve's book. I read it in a couple of days. It's a pretty big book, but uh, but yeah, that's her style. And I love that style. And that's why it's really influenced. Yeah, again, it's one of those books that I keep seeing on Twitter, but the, the kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the proximity to, to the another book on Twitter. I know, my, my, everybody's reading power goes out of control when we part with you. <laughs> a three book Friday, but yeah, I think the proximity to the to the virus and and the whole pandemic kind yeah. of makes me, uh, it does make me kind of I go woo a little bit. But um, <laughs> yeah. I think it also yeah I think fiction is also great for explaining these things isn't it? and helping us kind of order yeah. our thoughts. So I think. Uh, that's that's a, that sounds like a really kind of good book for doing that. Is it one that you've read, Sarah? Have you come across Eve's work? No, but I would quite like to read it. It's, mm. It sounds great. Um, the idea of it, I like literary thrillers, and I I I, 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 I wouldn't it wouldn't put me off the fact it's about a pandemic or whatever. Um, I think yeah, we're, we're cu- we seem to be coming out of it a little bit, don't we? So a bit more <laughs> relaxed. Maybe maybe in the, right in the heart of things, I wouldn't have uh, wanted to read about a pandemic. But no, it, it sounds really great, and you've you've really sort of sold it to me, really, in terms of, of, its, of its quality. Yeah. I think and a really interesting aspect of it is that it's set in the near future as well, isn't it? So how yeah. how, how convincingly does she create the future? Because I guess you know that, that's a real skill to an author, isn't it? Because you're asking the reader to come on a journey with you there, aren't you? And did you find it completely compelling and believable in that respect? I think so, yes. That That is why I'm recommending this book, because it is utterly believable. And it's not ex- exactly about a pandemic as such. I mean, it's not about a virus. It's about antibiotic resistance, where people, if even if a scratch, if you get a scratch, that can kill you. So it's about that. But the way she's written it, I, I mean, I was totally invested in the world, and I literally could not. I didn't do anything for two days. I read this book. <laughs> so I, that I think that can that should go some way in explaining how much I feel for this book. And I really, I called it my favorite book of 2020, and it really was. There really is no other book that comes close to what I read in 2020 so it's definitely my favorite. Excellent. So have you read it Nick? Is it one that you've come across? No it sounds like it would keep me awake for nights afterwards actually. <laughs> in, in a good <laughs> way or a bad way. Yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, um, not a great way no but, but, but I like that idea of, of a kind of dystopian mm. future and developing crime that that borrows from other genres from dystopian fiction and something that where there's a kind of science element to it and that's that can only be a good thing really to just like broaden the, the palette a bit yeah, and, yeah. I, and, I, and i guess obviously you don't want it to it's very difficult to do that not have the way date isn't it quickly but it sounds like this is a very kind of clever way of attacking it so hopefully it doesn't date quickly mm-hmm. it's a book that people can return yeah. to in, in, year, in years to come yeah, um, your, book, your book, Sarah, is um, From Doom with Death by um, Ruth Rendell. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I've been read several of your books. I can kind of see why that would be an influence on them, but I'll let you explain that to us. Yeah, I mean, I could have chosen any of Ruth Rendell's, uh, in particular her Wexford series, um, for for as my choice because I just love them all. Um, From Doom with Death is the first one, so it's the it's the novel that introduced uh, uh, Reg Wexford to the world, um, and I love. Well, I love all Ruth Rendell's writing when she writes as Barbara, Barbara Vine as well. But in her series, um, I think she sort of pr- provided the prototype for, for, for many sort of uh, police procedurals in terms of the detective. So I think that was a big influence on me. But also how she sort of focuses on the suburbs, the, uh, the small communities. So she creates her own community called Kings Markham. Um, in a fictional uh, county, sort of southern county, really. But nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, it's got this sort of, she's very good at showing the interiors of 
suburban houses and the very, very slight class distinctions between, you know, respectable working class and non-respectable and middle class and, and, and the sort of uh, preoccupations of all these different different people. Now, um, when I first read uh, from, from Doom with Death, I was a teenager again, and it's a very slim book. And, I, and that's the other thing I, I wish we could go back to is thinner crime novels um, that you could read in an afternoon. It's how I <laughs> grew up reading crime fiction, really. And uh, it, it, it's a slim book, all, all the early uh, Ruth Rendells are, and then they just get thicker and thicker, like, like as the sort of the, the times changed. But I don't want to give, a, give, give away the ending. I, don't, I, I hate talking about, about books and being quite oblique, but I won't give it, give it away. It was a shock at the time, the actual ending. Um, but um, now, in the uh, sort of modern era, you know, much more modern era, I, I don't think the um, the revelation would be a shock anymore. Um, I think uh, times have changed, and uh, it would, I wouldn't be surprised at who um, the killer was at all, or or, or 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 I might not be able to work out who it was, but I wouldn't be surprised at the actual motivation. But I remember being shocked as a teenager. Um, uh, it, it's about a murder of a, a housewife um, and uh, she's found uh, dead in a field and she seems very, very ordinary. There's no reason for her to be killed until they go look on a bookshelf and she's got some books on her shelf that just don't fit in with her character at all. And they're obviously part of a love affair that she had as a as a teenager. And they think that love affair has been rekindled as, a, as an adult. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it just really, really interesting premise and interesting uh, sort of solution really but I love all Ruth Rendell I could have chosen any of her books yeah really. absolutely is it do you think is it the plot of a character that kind of speaks to you as a writer most do you think because you know Wexford is such an iconic uh, building block into of kind of police characters throughout the years uh, so is it, is it was it the characters that kind of appeal more as a writer or was it the actual clever plotting of her work yeah I, I think it's her view on the world I think right. even though I don't perhaps share it we all have our own view on the world don't we it's that sort of looking for the slightly warped in the ordinary I think that's what's effect, you know sort of influenced me you can get a very ordinary situation it can be at a house it can be a hotel a hotel room it can be a school room whatever and it's looking for the slight weirdness in that and I think that's what she's really really good at doing and, and and she obviously brings that into her character and into the plotting and so on but it's the actual slant of looking on the world in in a way that I love P.D. James as well who was a contemporary but she doesn't have that kind of slight oddness to her writing that I think uh, Ruth Rendell does. Yeah, what about you Alice? have you read any of her books are you familiar with Ruth Rendell's work? Yes, I read a lot of her books back when I was a teenager. And as uh, Sarah's saying, they used to be slimmer. So yeah. it used to be much easier to read those <laughs> books. But now they've gotten, yeah, they're getting thicker and thicker. And there's so much, so much to do, so much to read and not enough time at all. But uh, yeah, I love Ruth Rendell's work. She's, she's an amazing writer. Yeah. How about you, Nick? Yeah. I'm guessing you must have read a fair few as well at various points. Yeah, about the same time, actually. Yeah. They were the sort of books that... Um, I was taken out from the library when I was sort of late teen, just getting in that, that idea that of you could read the book in an afternoon and you'd get a stack out from the library and just work through them through the week and then go back the next weekend and and get another load. And that I like that. I like mm. I think telling a story in such a short sort of word count it just makes a difference really to the way you approach it. Mm. <coughs> Yeah. And in, in quite a positive way, I think, because you you kind of in, your investment is can be a bit more intense. You know, you can afford to buy into that world because you'll know you you know you're not going to be with it for you know for, for too long. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Simenon as well, the Maygray novels, and I yeah. used to read those as a teenager. You know, sort of in an afternoon, and you, you immerse yourself in that world. It's like a short bite of something, and then you then you sort of finish it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, did it? What about the TV versions of Wexford as well? I always found them a little bit very different to the books. You know, they never kind of rang true in the same way for me. I don't know if that's kind of fair to say. Did you did you get a different set from the TV program? Yeah, I I, I quite like them. In fact, there was one yeah. on the other night. Um, George, is it George Baker? Isn't, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. With Wexford. Yeah, it was one on the other night, and I started watching it, and I thought, well, this is quite good, and it's fairly. Um, but TV adaptations often don't do it for me, really. 
Um, you know, I, I, like most, I, I normally uh, prefer the book. <laughs> <laughs> With my poss possible exception being um, Ted Lewis, I'm afraid, Nick Trifo, oh, no. we tend to prefer the adaptations. <laughs> There's a, a big topic for Nick to grapple with there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fed up with grappling. You can have that one. Yeah. But no, I think they're excellent choices. So, um, what, what are you reading at the moment, both of you? Because we've got a few minutes left, so we can have a little chat about that. What, what's kind of taking your fancy at the moment as, as readers? Well, uh, you, I don't want to answer that because I read eight or nine books at the same time. <laughs> but oh. I am... But right now, I, I am reading uh, The Last Apothecary by Sarah Penner and The Castaways by Lucy Clark. And I'm also reading some nonfiction, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Um, I've just started a, a book called The Lighthouse Witches by, um, I think it's C.J. Cook. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've literally only just started it. It looks, it sounds very gothic, a gothic historical um, and it's out at the end of September, so it's a proof on reading, but it, 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 it's looking really good. So, uh, yeah, I've just started reading that. Exactly. What about yourselves, Nick? The two um, Nicks? Well, I'm reading for festivals at the moment, so I'm kind of, it's kind of like what I call enforced reading. I'm kind of, I'm <laughs> interviewing the authors. But I, it's really great because I'm getting to read some books I wouldn't necessarily read. So, um, but I'm kind of, the one I'm really looking forward to reading is um, Bind Street by Dominic Nolan which uh, okay. is set in 1930s Soho in London. If anybody's seen that around on Twitter, the proofs are out now, and I think it's in the shops uh, in November, I think it is. So, uh, yeah, that looks real. I kinda, I'm kind of really into that kind of historical crime fiction. Mm -hmm. I think it's got that kind of slightly Peaky Blinders vibe, but set in London. So I think it's going to be, you know, in 1930s Soho, you can't really go wrong, can you? It's going to be such fertile ground for him as a writer. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of top of my pile for when I'm kind of finished with festival reading and I can just read for pleasure. So that's what I'm looking forward to. What you... I've got two on the pile at the moment. I'm reading The North Water. Oh, in wow. about Hal Noir, Talk mm. with Ian Maguire in October. Um, and just really, I mean, to be honest, that for, for a book which is so sort of evocative and dense, it's just, it just draws you in. Amazing, amazing novel. Really, really enjoying that. And uh, looking forward to talking to Ian about it. Um, and the next one, which is just I'm itching to get to, is um, a, a novel called Sergeant Salinger, which mm -hmm. is based on the early life of J.D. Salinger during the war when he was an intelligence officer. It's a novelised version of that. And one of my favourite ever short stories is um, for Esme with Love and Squalor, which if you haven't read it, it's, it's an incredible short story. It's brilliant. And that was J.D. Salinger, again, kind of autobiographically about his experiences during the war when he was in in Britain before he went off to um, with the, to the invasion of France so it's this idea of a, of, of a character of someone who's became a recluse and really about some of the reasons that he became you know this this kind of quite mysterious presence in American literature so looking forward to that one Fantastic. And I think that uh, mention of the novel it goes back to, to where he's talking about how he's combined a traditional thriller with a more literary aspect. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Northwater, I don't know if, if anybody else has read that, but you wouldn't find it in the crime section in a bookshop. You know, it was, it was book along listed. You'd find it in the, in the fiction area, but it's a crime novel. It's, it's 100% yeah. a crime novel, um, but it would never be kind of quite <coughs> a crime novel. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. It's back to that old debate into about crime fiction and literary fiction. So um, we've got a couple of minutes left. So quickly, uh, anyways, tell us a little bit about Noana before we finish your, your latest title, which is out now in the shops, isn't it? It's available in all formats. So uh, um, people can rush out and get it. Yes, absolutely. So Noana uh, is out uh, as paperback and as an ebook uh, everywhere in the UK and more, most of the territories all over the world. Uh, so No Honor is uh, about a 16 year old girl, Abda who lives in a small Pakistani village, uh, which is bound by age-old rules. So when the unthinkable happens for her, which is she falls pregnant out of wedlock, uh, she faces the same fate as so many other girls in her village, which is certain public death. And it's about how her father intervenes and gets her to escape to Lahore, which is the second largest city of Pakistan. She escapes to Lahore and then she disappears. And then her father goes in search of her and what, and it's about the trials and tribulations that they face together. And uh, so, yeah, that's 
I I can't give more away because that will I'll probably give away <laughs> the entire story that way. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that's what the book is about, and uh, it's out now. It's gotten some really good reviews. It's been selected as the the best book, one of the best books of 2021 by Women in Homes. So yeah, I'm Brilliant. very excited. And for you, Sarah, the shadowing is out. Well, it's actually out by the time this, this recording will go out to the, <laughs> the world, so. Um, it's your sort of second Gothic mystery, isn't it, as Rhiannon was? So just tell us about that if you can, yeah. Yeah, so I, I go back to the 1830s. So my last uh, Gothic novel was in the 1920s, and I've gone back this time to the 1830s, and um, my protagonist, Hester, is a Quaker, and uh, who, who also sees ghosts. And uh, she lives in Bristol and her sister has eloped um, with a, her lover and has ended up in penury in the Nottinghamshire workhouse, South, Southall in Nottinghamshire. And uh, she travels to the workhouse after her father dies to try and work out what's, uh, what's happened to her sister and how she ended up in the workhouse. And she discovers a, a conspiracy involving missing children and money exchanging hands. Um, yeah. That's probably as much as I can say. Yeah, you don't want to say too much, do you? So that's fantastic. Um, brilliant. brilliant. No one by Ewis Khan is available now. Um, the Shadowing by Rhiannon Ward is also available now. So thank you very much for joining us, guys. It's been great to chat about your favourite books. And we'll be back next month with more selections. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you.